This is Football at Four. Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. It's brought to you by Bet365. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. Bryce Huff just finished up talking to the media. And, of course, um, Saquon Barkley, you heard before that, on 97.3 ESPN. By the way, former 49er Eric Armstead signing with the Bills. So more free agent moves will be happening. And, uh, yeah, Huff is a guy who... He said he was very humbled by the fact that he is signing this deal. Remember, he was an undrafted rookie free agent at the time out of Memphis. So he said the fact that he has gotten a deal like this, he was very humbled. You could hear it in his voice. Kind of a timid kind of guy. A lot of, uh, you almost sound nervous that he was up there getting, you know, the questions that you get asked by the Philly media. I mean, you got guys coming at you from every single you know, spot on the floor there. And he was in New York with the Jets too. So I'm sure he gets a lot there as well. But, you know, He was getting asked a lot about that and the fact that he led that Jets team. You know, that was a good Jets defense last year. It's not a Jets defense that was, like, bottom of the barrel. They were a a playoff-level defense. They weren't a playoff-level quarterback and offense, but they certainly were a playoff-level defense last year. And the big thing, you know, that I'm interested in with Bryce Huff, so let's get into this a little bit. And I think Andrew may be at the press conference, so he might be jumping on here in a little bit here. Uh, We're trying to reach out to him and see uh, that press conference just finished up at the Novacare Complex. But so what happens here? Is it the Bryce Huff, Hassan Reddick, Bryce Huff, Josh Sweat, Bryce Huff, somebody new, Nolan Smith, How do the Eagles handle the Sweat and Reddick situation? Is it one, neither, both? How is that going to play out? I'm really intrigued by this. You know, Vic Fangio is a guy who I'm wondering, because Bryce Huff is not great against the run. Can you pair Huff and Reddick up and say, like, especially with the linebacking situation that you have right now, Like, there is not a linebacker on this team that you feel very confident about right now. So I guess you're looking at this and saying, how are you stopping the run with those two defensive ends or two edge rushers, if you will, and those linebackers? So I still can't kind of figure out what the plan is with the two guys who are on the block right now. And which of the guys is more desirable? Like, if you're a team, do you go after Josh Sweat because he's younger? Do you go after Hassan Reddick because you think he's the better player? Obviously, both guys have different levels of interest around the league, I would imagine. Some teams might say, hey, we want Sweat. He's a cheaper. I still can't figure out in my mind whether I think Hassan Reddick would go cheaper. Would you get back more in return for Reddick or more for Sweat? Now, Reddick is obviously the better player. But for the money and the age, would you say, I'll just take Josh Sweat? Good player, don't have to pay him as much. Would you go down that road? The other thing that I find interesting with this whole situation is, do the Eagles say, now that we have Huff here, we actually want to bring Reddick back? Like, would they say... Yeah, we want him back and because we want to pair him up with Huff. So I, I'm quite intrigued by how this whole situation is going to kind of play itself out here over the next, you know, we've got a month until the draft. The draft is uh, April, so a little over a month uh, to the draft. I also wonder, and we're going to uh, get Mosher. He's filling in for DeCecco today. So we'll, th- this will be interesting because we – didn't get a chance to talk to him about this yesterday, but we'll uh, we'll kind of get Jeff's take on this. Now that we've heard from Barkley, we've heard from Huff, and we get an opportunity to kind of hear what everything, how everything's kind of shaken out now that these guys are officially in the fold. But that'll be interesting. What is next with Sweat and, and Reddick? And then, of course, you just heard from Huff. How does he kind of fit into the whole equation here? 609. 609- 403-0973, 609-403-0973. Jeff Mosher from Inside the Birds Podcast, insidethebirds.com, set to join us now 
uh, for a little football at four, a little impromptu Jeff Mosher visit. I'm actually happy because Mosher is a Penn State guy, and he he saw the big smile on the face of uh, Saquon Barkley today as he got the opportunity. All right, let's bring Mosh in for football at four here on a Thursday edition, 97.3 ESPN, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Uh, oh, Andrew, sorry. Now I got a Mosher on my screen. Now I got an Andrew back on my screen. So who am I talking to now? The Checo's here. All right, good. I'm glad. I wanted to talk to the Checo. What's up, man? Hey, Mike, how you doing, man? I'm all good. A busy day. We know all the uh, – um, press conferences going on, and I'm, I'm I'm intrigued by to hear how you feel all this fits. So let's start with Barkley in your mind. You know, he talked about the RPO and how you're going to stop us and all that. We hear that kind of talk when things like this happen. But ultimately, my take on this, Andrew, was Barkley's got to be a significant upgrade over what they had to justify the price tag. Do you see that? Do you see Barkley as a significant upgrade? Well, they're, they're getting a three-down running back who's going to remain on the field for the entirety of the game, more or less, sprinkled in with some Kenny Gainwell. But he's a good pass protector. He can catch the football. He's a bruising runner between the tackles. So you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're getting a complete player. And Howie Roseman has proven that he's willing to shell out money for a player that he feels is worth it. And he's getting an elite talent, at least in his eyes. And I'm interested to see how... Saquon is utilizing this offense and also how he uh, pairs with Jeff Stoutland, the running game coordinator. I think that that's going to be a pretty perfect marriage, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm interested because we did the math, uh, Andrew. Last year, the three backs had 1,900 total yards. We're receiving and rushing all three of them. That's Swift, that's Scott, uh, who didn't have a lot, but uh, Swift, Swift, Scott, and Gainwell. 1,900 yards rushing and receiving, and eight touchdowns. In your mind, does Barkley have to eclipse that? Like, you know, does that number matter to you at all? No, I I think Saquon needs to just be the healthiest version of himself, and and I think everything else is going to take care of itself because defenses are going to have to play the Eagles accordingly, and I think that he's going to be effective in short yardage. He's going to have an impact there and alleviate some of the hits that Jalen Hurts was taking on the short yardage plays. And I also think that as a receiver, he's really going to to aid this offense, which really didn't utilize the running backs in the passing game. So I think that's an area where you're going to see a lot of added benefit. But I don't know that there's a certain number that he needs to reach for it to be deemed a successful signing. His impact can be felt in other ways. And he's going to have plenty of opportunities, and he will have an impact but I don't know that you can measure it based on numbers. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people ask the question that, you know, Swift was the guy who was supposed to catch the ball a lot. He didn't do that. Uh, Barkley had 91 catches his rookie year. Now, he hasn't come close to that in recent times, but is this an offense that we envision will finally go to that? Is that, a, is that a Hurts thing that he doesn't like to throw the ball there? Why do we think the running backs haven't been involved in the pass game? And, and that Because that's an area that Barkley does excel. Yeah, that's not an element of Jalen Hurts' game. Now, that's going to have to change under Kellen Moore because that is something that he looks to tap into offensively, looking at his history with Tony Pollard, what he was able to do with a, a banged-up Austin Eckler last season. Zeke Elliott even got involved in the passing game. That This is going to be a, a facet of the offense and a much-needed one. You know, Saquon Barkley is a running back who caught 91 passes at one point as a rookie. He is is a three-down player, and you want to maximize the value of what you just invested. So I think that you're going to see that. Tap. I thought that DeAndre Swift should have been utilized more in that area, and he wasn't. Yep. But I think Saquon certainly will be under Kellen Moore, and Kenny Gainwell, too, for that matter. Their short yardage, uh, the, the dump-offs and taking what defenses give you versus – going for the big play like they were doing so often last year, I think that's going to be a thing of the past under this regime. Andrew DeCecco, Football 4 from InsideTheBirds.com. Uh, how about his pass blocking? That That's not glamorous. That's not something that people talk about. But it was obvious that late in the year, teams were taking advantage of the inability to block and pick up the blitzes. Barkley very good at that. Yeah, he's good at it. He's certainly a, a significant upgrade over what they currently had there and that's what look that's what you're paying for you're paying for somebody that does not leave the field and who can impact the game in a number of different ways which is what Sa- Saquon Barkley is he's one of the premier running backs in this football league so that's what you're going to see and uh, yeah I think that that's a 
that's a, an underrated facet of this game that when you look at what they currently had or what they had last season and DeAndre Swift and Kenny Gangwell was better at it, but he wasn't really equipped to, to stand in there and, and hold up as a pass blocker either. And I thought that that was, that contributed to some of the offensive shortcomings and limited what they were able to do. But having someone like Saquon opens up the playbook in, in its entirety. All right, uh, let's go to uh, Bryce Huff, who we just heard finish up uh, his portion of the press conference here. Very humble guy. I mean, not drafted. He yeah. talked about, hey, uh, I wasn't making a lot of money now. I mean, he was asked about it three-year 51. There's a lot of peels of the onion here. So first off on the surface, uh, your thoughts on Bryce Huff. I'm sure you're probably pretty familiar with him at Memphis. He gets undrafted. Comes into the league, not a whole heck of a lot of impact. And then last year, he kind of breaks through. So how does Huff fit into this defense in your mind? Yeah, I am pretty familiar with him. I got a chance to see him up close for a week at the East West Shrine Bowl. Was stunned that he didn't get drafted. I thought he'd be a situational pass rusher early in his career, which he was. But I thought that he was good enough to, to hear his name called through seven rounds. Nevertheless, he really only collected seven and a half sacks through his first three seasons with the Jets. And then he had a breakout season a season ago, obviously, with the double digit packs of 10. And he's a undersized pass rusher, but he has such a quick burst off the line, a really good understanding of leverage and pad level and his hands extremely well. And I think that he's going to provide some explosive, explosiveness off the line. And you know what? I think that uh, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked here that need to be answered here because Here's someone that only played 42% of the snaps last season, 480 snaps, 480 uh, snaps. So compared to what you saw last season with uh, Son Reddick playing 74%, Josh Sweat playing 71%, he's going to have to take on an expanded workload, and that has yet to be seen. So they invested in an ascending player that they're sort of betting is going to take the leap forward. Um what does this, in your mind, mean for the other two guys, Sweat and Reddick? Uh, this, to me, is the fascinating part. Do they both go? Do they want one? If they keep one, what one fits better with Huff? Do they keep all three? How do you see that next peel of the onion going? Well, I think they're, I think one of them certainly is going to be on the outs. And when you look at the money that they shelled out for Bryce Huff, that leads you to believe that they're not going to be able to keep everybody and someone's not going to be happy and they're going to look to maybe allocate resources elsewhere and look at linebacker and safety. Now, how do you do that? Well, the market's getting a little bit dry, so the trade market may be the the best way to go. And I think that Josh Sweat would have the most trade appeal, being younger, more dynamic, scheme versatility. Remember, Hassan Reddick isn't equipped to fit everyone's scheme that most of his career teams didn't know what to do with him, but the Eagles found a way to tap into it and deploy him to his, you know, to the best accentuate what he does well. So I think Josh sweat would be the one on the outs and the one that's going to probably yield you something in return of, of significance. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because um, you put Reddick and Huff on the edges with the linebackers. They currently have, we can get into that in, in a minute. How's that team look against the run? Not great. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> not, you know, not great that's, is a great that's, answer. <laughs> that's that's something that needs to be taken into account. And Nolan Smith, for that matter, isn't yep. uh, good throw. Wasn't fantastic against the run either. That's an area of his game that he needs to work on. So they're gonna they're gonna have some some questions to be answered. Here. Josh Sweat is good against the run. So, but he also went radio silent during that skid, and you have to wonder about his long term potential and given the, the leg injury that gruesome leg injury that he sustained early in his you know in, in high school and how that projects so right now i think he's probably at the at the hit at his prime and you could probably get something for him but yeah you're gonna have to keep an eye on that running game because if, if reddick's there it doesn't matter if, if reddick nolan smith bryce Huff, none of those guys are really sound run defenders um let's go to linebacker what are some of the Thoughts in your mind, trade candidates, anybody still available in free agency, or is this – there's two parts of this that I have. The draft, do they think Ben Van Sumeren is way better than maybe people are giving him credit for? I know you like Van Sumeren. Yeah, BVS is my guy. I've been on him for a while. I think that he really showed notable development. There's a lot of folks that agree with me in the assessment of his film and the game that he got a chance to start. Looked markedly improved from an instinctual standpoint. And I think that the Eagles really like him. In fact, I know this for a fact. They've, they've invested in his development. So he's someone that will factor into their plans. Now, as a starter, 
probably not, but somebody who I think can contribute in sub packages because he is so dynamically talented athletically and, and all those good things. But right now, free agency, the market's a little bit dry. I would say Tyrell Dodson, I haven't been able to, you know, there's so many things have been going on today. I don't know if Tyrell Dodson has signed yet, but he was someone that I sort of circled as, as being a good fit even before the tampering period started. There, that's about it. Unless you want to look to, to hit the trade market, and that's what you know, sort of what I alluded to earlier. Maybe you look for a player who was on the last year of their rookie deal. You know, if I'm just throwing a name out there, Ernest Jones from the Rams would be a player uh, that fits that mold. I don't know if the Rams would be willing to part with them, but really, really good player would in- instantly upgrade the unit. So maybe they look like, look, maybe they look to a team that has someone of that of that ilk. Yeah, I know that. Um... A lot of people wondering about what's happening at linebacker. Let's get your thoughts on Chauncey Gardner-Johnson returning and, and what he brings. Um, did you like that, or was there a different safety that maybe you would have targeted? Yeah, I would have targeted Cam Curl. I, I think it's uh, it, it's a crime that he's still out there. I don't I don't know what the what the holdup is. I know that he's one of the more underrated defensive backs in the NFL, and where, whoever lands him is getting a, a, a really – uh, really impactful back end player who can be the quarterback of their defense. But all that being said, CJ Gardner Johnson is a good signing, especially for what the Eagles are paying. He's a, a ball hawk. He has swagger. He has the personality that you really need. And I think that that really resonates throughout the entire secondary on a team that really didn't ha- look lifeless many times throughout the season. I think that adding someone of his caliber uh, sort of. Uh, rises the, the level of play and the competition, the competitive juices of, of everyone around him. So I, I like the signing. You do need to be mindful of his health, right? This is someone who has missed 24 games over the past three seasons. And the one thing I will be keeping an eye on is he's been known as a freelancer a little bit. And, and Vic Vangio is, has a no-nonsense policy. He's an authoritarian, and he commands accountability out of all of his players. So you want to see how, how that sort of gels with someone like Gardner Johnson, who, who, who is a free spirit. Yeah. So that's something that uh, I think bears watching. Do you like a potential safety group of Gardner Johnson and Sidney Brown? I do. I just wish we would have seen more of Sidney because it's hard for me to give a definitive answer when I thought that there were opportunities to get him on the field earlier in the season instead of maybe a, a Justin Evans or, or, or Terrell Edmonds. I, I think Sidney Brown has done some – did some good things and showed some growth late in the season. He's a tough physical player, tenacious, gets downhill fast, plays with his hair on fire. But I still think that he needed more reps to really develop into something that they could feel comfortable with moving forward as a, as a starter. I think he's probably a, a situational guy right now. Remember, he's not going to be available until probably mid-September, I would guess, coming off the ACL. But I, I think someone like a, maybe a low-cost guy out there like a Jordan Fuller would be a nice addition to compliment Gardner-Johnson. You still have Reed Blankenship there and, and Sidney Brown coming back from the injury. Uh, Andrew DeCecco, let's look at a couple of the, the under-the-radar signings, I guess they are. Uh, Devontae Parker, if you're an Eagles fan, you remember he crushed you in 2019. 159 yards, two touchdowns. But I don't know that he has 159 yards total since that game. He does, but that was a breakout game for him. Uh, are you intrigued at all by Parker in this offense? Uh, I mean, I, I like Devontae Parker coming out of Louisville, but he really hasn't lived up to ex- he hadn't lived up to expectations. I mean, he's he's gotten nine years, I guess, out of out of his out of the league, and he's injury prone right now. It, he doesn't create a whole lot of separation. He's more of a go up and get it contested catch receiver, which there's always room for that on the roster, but. If he struggles with injuries or, or inconsistencies, or there's a, a rookie or an undrafted player or maybe a late free agent signing in the second or third wave that they feel performs better than he does and offers more upside, well, he could be on the roster bubble. So he's far from a lot to make the roster, but I think you could do far worse as a number three. All right, uh, Matt Hennessy, I'm intrigued by this because center has started at center, some left guard. They have a right guard opening. Is he a candidate for that spot for you, or is this a depth piece? Uh, he's a depth piece all the way. That's the way I read that signing. And I think someone like a John Runyon Jr. would have been a nice addition via free agency as a right guard. But, I mean, <laughs> he signed Drew Rosenhaus, so he was not He was going to command a pretty high price tag. And given all the money that the Eagles spent in the first day and, and you know, uh, since then, I he would have probably been off the table there. But I think you need to look through the draft to make sure that you maybe get 
a tackle with guard versatility and you know, a versatile player that you can plug in at right guard because I don't know that you want to go into it the offseason penciling in Tyler Steen as the right guard of the future without having seen a ton. Remember, he got yanked after that Dallas game, didn't really impress, and they went back to Sua Opeta. So unless they're very confident in his growth and development and they have a good pulse on that, I don't know how you do that. I think you need to still address that area. Cam Jurgens is the center of the future, and there's a big hole at right guard, in my opinion, right now as we stand. All right, uh, last guy would be Zach Bond. Uh, is more of a special teams guy, or is there more for you? Yeah, he's more of a special teams guy, sub-package, sparingly. I mean, kind of like a Patrick Johnson. Third-round pick, I did like him coming out of Wisconsin, but he hasn't lived up to expectations. Don't really think that the Saints – got what they thought they were going to get out of him. I don't think that you draft a guy in the third round and expect him to be a special teamer and, you know, a uh, complimentary player. But I, I, I am interested to see, and I had to jet out of there before the, the Bond interview, but I am interested to see how, what he knows about Vic Vangio's defense and how he expects to fit into the equation. Because it's an interesting signing if they, you know, assuming they have a plan and how to use him and best accentuate what he does well. But I haven't seen a lot on tape, a lot of juice or anything like that that leads me to believe that he's going to be a high-impact player or even a moderate-impact player. But, uh, I mean, these are the guys you roll into camp and you see what you got and you put him in position to be successful, and, and the Eagles are going to be able to maximize what he does well. Uh, all right, Andrew, anything you would like to see in free agency? Do you think they've already accomplished enough and they kind of start focusing on the draft, or are there some other little things that uh, you're kind of keeping an eye on? They need a backup quarterback. I mean, I heard I heard uh, someone on your show a couple of days ago say that uh, you know they they really believe in Tanner McKee and they wouldn't you know they they should move forward with him and that that was the thought process. I I mean, look, this this is a team with a Super Bowl window wide open. You and I have we, we tweeted back and forth about Tyler Huntley. They they prioritize the backup quarterback position and that's something that I would expect that to continue this year, especially while the Super Bowl window is still open. You don't want any. You don't want anything to hinge on on Tanner McKee, who probably still isn't ready to be the number two on a Super Bowl contending roster, uh, by all estimation. Yeah, I, I, you know, Huntley would be fine for me. Um, the whole Fields thing. I don't know if there's any indication that they would move him for um, a cheaper price tag, but I said I'd offer a fifth and, and see what they say. If you have no offers, fifth's better than nothing right now. I'm not saying they take it. But I, I do field for fifth, and my reasoning for that, Andrew, would be I need a backup quarterback. I agree with you, but a fifth-round pick is not going to be my fifth, my backup quarterback. So if I can use one of those fifths to acquire someone to fill a hole with fifth-round picks, I feel like i got to steal. 100%. I mean, can he win you more games at press into duty than Marcus Mariota? Absolutely. And that, that he's still on his deal. So, I mean – Offered and, and what, what, the worst that happens is they shoot it down. But you're, you would be getting a, the the highest uh, caliber backup in the NFL, and then you know maybe a potential trade target. Yeah, well, it, that's the big it, thing. It, 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 that's the big thing. Team, Andrew, yeah, exactly. is what you should could possibly team, yeah what you could possibly spin him off to get. Yeah, I mean, should a team sustain an injury in training camp? I mean, imagine what what Justin Fields would yield. So I think that you know, knowing how the Eagles and they look long term and things like that, that wouldn't surprise me. But again, it all comes down to the asking price. If they're not getting any takers, why not? All right, buddy. Uh, Andrew DiCecco is now for first week of free agency almost in the books, and then it's DiCecco season. It's Howie season now, and then it turns into DiCecco season, getting ready for the draft. And we'll have that for you here on Football at Four. Don't forget to follow him and, of course, read him over at InsideTheBirds.com. Andrew, all right, buddy. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.